Good morning. Welcome to Bethany Lutheran in Warren, Oregon. Today I'm preaching from the 16th chapter of Matthew, verses 21 through 28. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Most of you have heard the song, I Can Only Imagine. The singer is trying to imagine what he will do once he reaches heaven. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in awe of you be still? Will I stand in your presence? Or on my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. The book of Revelation describes heaven as so incredible, so beautiful, so filled with love, that even with the vivid picture painted in the book of Revelation, we have trouble picturing heaven. There's nothing in our life experience with which to compare heaven, and so we can only imagine what our reaction will be. Well, in today's text, it's poor old Peter. He doesn't have time to think about heaven. He's struggling to imagine what is going on in Jesus' mind. So far, the disciples have been watching Jesus perform a wide variety of miracles. He has stomped on Satan's demons sent to wreak havoc in earthly lives. He's gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and beaten them at their own games. It's been good. It's been exciting. But the disciples are anticipating the day when Jesus pulls out all the stops and establishes his reign on earth. And now this, verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. No way. Peter, the self-appointed spokesman for the disciples, takes Jesus aside and works on straightening out his thinking. Whoa, Jesus, get a grip. I get it. You're tired. You need a break. But don't back down now. You've got the power of God on your side, and we've got your back, and the people are with you. You can't back down now. I can just see it now. First, we take out the temple authorities. Then we kick the Romans out of Jerusalem. And finally, you send those Romans hoofing it out of Israel and back to Rome. No way, Jesus. No one's going to take you out. Just like that, Peter goes from Rocky the Blessed to Satan's right-hand man. Jesus calls Peter a scandalon, 
a scandal. In Greek, the word refers to a rock over which a person stumbles. Within minutes, Peter goes from being a foundation stone to a stumbling block. You see, Peter couldn't imagine. He could not imagine that Jesus had come not to make this world easier, but to free people on a much grander scale. Jesus wants to free us for eternity. Jesus introduces a culture that runs on forgiveness, mercy, and love into a world run by revenge, violence, and hate. So Peter should not be surprised that Jesus would end up being killed. I mean, after all, the first attempt took place when Jesus was a baby, when Herod slaughtered all the nation's children under the age of two in hopes of destroying Jesus before he could even make a move on Herod's throne. Herod could not imagine any fate worse than losing his throne. What is hard to imagine is that God raised Jesus from the dead. The resurrection proves that Jesus' life, love, and sacrifice will prevail. Poor Peter is no different than folks today. It's hard to believe that more money, a bigger home with no mortgage, a vacation timeshare, winning the lottery, moving out of the city or moving to another country will not give us all the freedom we need. We look at society today and know that more love, more compassion, more forgiveness would fix everything. Yet it is hard to imagine that it could ever happen. And so people buy more lotto tickets, more alcohol, more drugs, in the hope of finding freedom, if only for a little while. Yet so many settle for a little comfort that the world offers now instead of the complete freedom that Jesus offers later. Really, can we blame a non-believer for not believing? What do we offer as the life of a Christian? Forgive instead of seeking retribution. Even if you have a little, give it away. I know you worked hard for decades to get where you are, but sell the nice home, drop the country club membership, sell the lake cabin, cash out your annuity, and give it all away. Love those who ridicule you. Forgive and Pray for the drunk who put your child in a wheelchair. Continue to pray for and wish well to the spouse who walked out on you and the kids. Provide compassion and pay for the care for your brother who is dying because of life choices that broke your mother's heart and drained her retirement account. Can you imagine doing that? Jesus, this is crazy talk. You see, it is all part of the deal, part of living a life shaped by the cross of Jesus. Living under the cross requires a weakness that hell cannot attack. Living under the cross means vulnerability, suffering servanthood, and a gentle love. Does the world really want to have everyday life shaped by the cross? Do you really want to have your everyday life shaped by the cross? Last week, I asked who of us has the courage to speak of hope and salvation in the workplace or in the courthouse. Well, this week, I want you to think of another scenario. Who pictures a Wall Street trading floor and Christianity as fitting together? 
picture people screaming out bids and frantically typing the word sell now because every second counts to really make money or to lose everything. Prior to September 11, 2001, no one would have thought to place a cross anywhere in the plaza of the World Trade Center. The Trade Center already had its cross to hang on. It was the almighty dollar. The editor of Time magazine, in a special edition of the magazine that came out right after the terrorist attack that destroyed the World Trade Center, wrote, if you want to humble a nation, you attack its cathedrals. The Twin Towers were cathedrals of commerce. Yet who can forget the picture of the enormous iron girder cross towering over ground zero in the International Finance Center of Lower Manhattan? The place where the Twin Towers stood and collapsed, a cross a humongous cross was all that remained standing. It gives such meaning to the hymn, In the Cross of Christ I Glory, Towering Over the Wrecks of Time. Isn't that what we find when we see fields of crosses at Arlington National Cemetery and acres of crosses near Normandy, France? The cross towering over the wrecks of time. Who could have imagined that an instrument of grotesque torture would become a symbol of faith for all time? Yet that is exactly what the cross does. When the woes of life o'ertake me, hopes deceive and fears annoy, never shall the cross forsake me, Lo, it glows with peace and joy. The cross becomes an intersection of death's finality and the only eternal hope. John Adams, the second U.S. president, said, Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate for a government of any other. In other words, unless our country remains Christian, the Constitution will not function properly. Well, I think our judicial system is proving his point. The Constitution is being reinterpreted in the light of society's changing standards. And if you have enough money, you can make the Constitution say what will benefit you. Religion does not have the influence it once had. Society says there are no absolutes, no one truth. Many say that religion is no longer relevant. Dennis Prager, the Jewish social critic and scholar, says his favorite response to whether religion is relevant is a story. Say you're walking down an alley at 11 p.m in New York, Miami, Los Angeles. The dim streetlights illuminate your car 300 yards away. And suddenly you see 10 young men wearing leather jackets swaggering down the alley toward you. Would you feel more comfortable if you knew those young men had just come out of a Bible study? Every time Prager has asked that question, the answer has been yes. In spite of what they say in polls, on the most practical level, people acknowledge religion's positive influence. Our society cannot exist without Christianity, and Christianity cannot exist without the cross. The cross is the dramatic symbol of our faith, hope, love and forgiveness because the cross is the powerful reminder of God's sacrificial and redemptive love for us. The cross is the constant signal to us of how God wants us to live and love today as sacrificial servants. It reminds us to emulate the servant spirit of our Lord. 
And if we do, oh, what a world that would be. I can only imagine.